In this video, we'll look at some of the religious debate that flowed from the abolitionists as the uh, Civil War developed. Certainly, one thing that all the abolitionists had in common uh, was that they're, they're going to push their religious concerns in politics. They told their people to, quote, vote as you pray and pray as you vote. While the abolitionist religious views, which were discussed previously, are easy to understand, the biblical argument of the slave owners seemed uh, kind of odd to us today, but it was uh, embraced by a lot of people in the South. Slavery, they said, was in the Bible. The Bible spoke of a, quote, cursed descendants of Ham, unquote, who the Old Testament said have offspring that were, quote, dark-skinned and destined to be servants of servants. This, some Southerners claimed, was where African Americans came from. They were Ham's descendants. Slavery, they also argued, allowed freemen to develop a society of more civic virtue. Uh, it's, it's more, it's what's left rough and tumble competition and more cooperation and love like encouraged in the Bible. They, they noted that nowhere in the Bible did, did Jesus explicitly condemn slavery. The Apostle Paul, they noted, even condoned slavery. He, he told slaves to obey their masters. Some uh, slave owners even went so far as to say that God endorsed slavery, that, you know, that, that standing up for slavery was a religious issue. And in any event, the, the fact that there was separation of church and state, the slave owners said, prohibited the government from abolishing it because, indeed, it was a religious issue. The question of slavery united some of the uh, faiths in America. Obviously, the Quakers were uniformly uh, abolitionist, and deists tended to be in favor of uh, uh, getting rid of slavery. But among many Protestant churches, as the Civil War approached, slavery was a divisive issue. And, and you know, and so it, it 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 directly split a lot of denominations, north and south. Uh, it started as early as the Jackson era when the Presbyterians began to split in 1837, just after Andrew Jackson left office, when some more liberal Presbyterians in the north began working with Congregationalists in spreading a, a theological argument against slavery. The National Assembly of the Presbyterian Church imposed a ban in 1837 on all Presbyterians talking about slavery. The church was already fighting over how doctrinaire the church should be, how much you know it should follow strict rules, and have much how much autonomy individuals should have. This was known at the time as the old school, the strict doctrinaire Presbyterians, and the new school, the liberal uh, doctor, the less doctrinarians, and so the split. Uh, was even more deeper when you considered slavery. In 1861, by the way, as the Civil War began, the old school in the South split from the new school in the North, and so there were two churches, the Southern Presbyterian Church and the Northern Presbyterian Church. The Methodist Church was the next to follow. The national leadership tried to stave off division during Andrew Jackson's presidency by issuing a statement in 1836 that recognized the evils of slavery, but also condemning, quote, modern abolitionism. This did not satisfy the Northern Methodist opponents of slavery, who uh, began to form various congregations outside of the national church, most notably in the states of Michigan and New York. In 1844, however, the issue came to a head when James Osgood Andrew of Georgia was elected a, a bishop. He'd not bought slaves himself, but had married a slave-owning woman, and, and thus now he owned slaves. Now, Northerners demanded that the National Church kick him out as a bishop. When the national leadership agreed, a rather amicable parting was arranged, and the Southern slave owners left. The top official in the church said, quote, let them go as brethren, beloved in the Lord, and let us hear their voice, responsive, claim us for brethren. The, the good feeling didn't last, however, as a dispute over who owned church property soon developed. The U.S. Supreme Court even had to be called into the dispute, agreeing to decide property ownership between what became known as the Northern Methodist and the Southern Methodist. The Baptists were the next to split. 
their fight was different than the Presbyterians and Methodists because they didn't have any national organization. They just coordinated joint missions and evangelical efforts. Their churches had initially agreed to just remain neutral in slavery, but as the Northern Abolitionist movement grew, increasingly Baptist abolitionists protested. Finally, in 1844, a slave owner, James Reeve, was appointed as a leading missionary to the Indians. Northern Baptists protested. How could a missionary own other human beings? When Northern Baptists began to try to push Reeve out and prohibit other slave-owning missionaries, the Southern Baptists split off. The Northern Baptist Convention and the Southern Baptist Convention formed as separate churches. I, I could note that by the 21st century, the Southern Baptist Convention had become the largest Protestant denomination. In any event, this concludes the short little video on how, uh, as abolitionism grew, it began to uh, it began to split religions in America.